that I'm sure she deserves much more, but I was attend planning on attending this uh, workshop, so I was really excited to meet Christina and her friends. Hello, do you hear us? In Nova Scotia? Oh, they said to un unmute their mic, yes. Oh, okay, let yeah. them hear us. So they can't see us, but they can hear us. Uh, Christina Llewellyn is the Director of Digital Oral Histories for Reconciliation, and an Associate Professor of Social Development Studies at Renison University College in the University of Waterloo. Uh, you can read the rest of this in our little program here, but she's here to talk to us today about her project, Digital Oral Histories for Reconciliation, the Nova Scotia Home for Colored Children History Education Initiative. And we're really lucky to have her here, and we are really exceptionally lucky to be connected to our colleagues, despite our uh, technology issues this morning. And yesterday, so welcome, Christina. Thank you so much. Thanks. So this this is uh, can can we hear you yet? Can you unmute? Yeah. I'm trying to get them the to unmute. There's this muted. I think they're controlling that. There we go. Unmute attendee. There we go. We can hear okay. you. Can you hear us? Your mic's muted. Oh, mine is muted here. There's so much technology. Um, can you hear us? Okay, great. I'm going to turn you up. Okay. So, um, of course, the internet went down. Um, in a, a presentation in which it was vitally important that we have an Adobe meeting connect because my collaborators are in Nova Scotia. Um, so, really, it was fundamental that they be here to join you and, and meet all of you. Um, so, we've created a hotspot on my phone. Uh, and I'm hoping that lasts. Uh, so please bear with us. And we did it within 10, 10 minutes notice. So we're, we're working through this. And it is a tech project, so I already feel like we're, we're in good standing. This is great. Um, so I want to thank the conference organizers for um, inviting uh, the DOOR project to uh, be with you. Uh, I just found out that they had seen one of the news articles in the Waterloo Record about the project this summer and so knew more about it. So that's great to see that we're able to sort of uh, get news out about this work, which we think is really important. Um, and I want to begin by acknowledging, of course, um, that we're really privileged and grateful to be here um, learning and gathering uh, with the on the traditional territory of the neutral Anishinaabe, let's ignore all the emails I get, um, the, neutral, the neutral Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee uh, peoples, of course, we're giving thanks to be situated on the Haldeman Track, the land promised to the Six Nations that includes six miles on each side of the Grand River. Um, so my name is Christina Llewellyn, I'm an associate professor in social development studies. Um, one of my colleagues, uh, Craig Forte, presented yesterday, and I wish I had been able to attend that talk. Um, and um, I'm honored to be joined by um, actually three members. We didn't expect that Jerry Morrison would be able to join us, but he is here with us, yay. Um, so three members of the DOOR Project. So I'll have them introduce themselves. Cool. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me all right? Yes. Yeah. Yep. So I'm Jennifer Llewellyn. I'm a professor of law at the Shiloh School of Law at Dalhousie, and uh, I um, uh, I'm a member of the council parties and, and have been working with uh, voices of former residents for some time to uh, help them secure a response to uh, the historic abuse in the home for colored children and also uh, to look forward and, as we are now to working with the restorative inquiry. I'll we'll turn it over and let Tony uh, and Jerry introduce themselves. Well, my name is Sonny Smith. I'm a former resident of Nova Scotia Home for Colored Children, also a co chair of Voices. Victim of Institutional Knowledge Exploitation Society, helped advocate as a film. Oh, don't tell me no. Chair, uh, are you there still? You frozen? We're working hard here. We're trying. The connection is still there on our end. And we've just lost them. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead, which we had already planned on the beginning part of the presentation, and just to tell you a little bit about Jerry when Jerry um, when they come back in. Jerry is also a co-director of Voices, um, and he is part of the Restorative Inquiry Council <coughs> parties um, to look at redressing the harm of uh, the home. And we'll be telling you more about the inquiry a little bit later on 
um, in the presentation. DOOR um, is a shirk funded partnership project that creates and assesses virtual reality oral histories for students to address the historical harms of racism stemming from the Nova Scotia Home for Colored Children. So in the presentation, what we have planned is that um, Tony, once we see them again, um, Tony, um, who is, as you know, already an activist and former resident of the Nova Scotia Home for Colored Children, is going to share his experience um, about the home and the legacy of the home for the African Nova Scotia community. And Jennifer, who is a renowned uh, international expert in restorative justice, was going to uh, explain a little bit about the um, really, again, groundbreaking restorative inquiry that's been launched by the province um, about the Nova Scotia Home for Colored Children. And I'm fortunate to be with the technical title of director of DOOR, and I'm going to address the need for history education for the redress of the legacy of social welfare harms. So while I hope they join us, um, I'm going to move on uh, with the presentation. For some reason, this is not showing up either. The person who's helping with tech still Oh, they're back, great. And now I just have to be able to get to the next slide somehow in the presentation. Oh, you're there. That's great. We can hear you again. Jerry, do you mind introducing hey, your, do you mind introducing yourself again, Jerry? Sorry, I tried to, to introduce on yourself on your behalf, which is not very good. So could you do that? Don't don't you dare. <laughs> I'm Gary Morrison. I'm also a former member of the Park and a member of the Council of Parties, and also a member of Voices. And also keeps good humor for all of us <laughs> as we do the work. Okay, so as we try and get to the next slide somehow, um, I just want to tell you a little bit about the history of the home uh, for some of you, and I think most people are very unfamiliar. On June 6, uh, 1921, a three-quarter mile parade of dignitaries and a crowd of 3,000 spectators gathered for the opening of the Nova Scotia Home for Colored Children. This was the largest gathering of blacks since the arrival of the Loyalists in that province in 1783. The opening was described in newspapers as, quote, the greatest event in the history of colored people in Nova Scotia. James Robinson Johnston, the first black graduate of Dalhousie, as well as Dalhousie's law school, proposed in 1908 the establishment of a normal and industrial institute for black children in Nova Scotia. His proposal was inspired by noted educator Booker T. Washington's Tuskegee Institute in Alabama. That was founded in 1881 as a self-help school to provide practical education for blacks. While Johnston was fortunate to receive an education himself, generally black children in Nova Scotia either did not have access to education or went to segregated schools. In 1965, Nova Scotia actually officially legislated segregated schools and the last segregated school closed in 1983. Similar to in Ontario, we also had legislated uh, segregated schooling up until the 1960s. Johnston, along with others, drew upon a tradition of self-reliance by the black community for an institute that would not only be a training school, but would also shelter orphaned and abandoned children. Now, as you know from probably a number of the speakers already at this conference, institutions became a major feature in Canadian children's lives by the end of the 19th century when families were either unable or considered unsuitable to raise certain children. The state took an active role in child welfare based on the assumption that institutions could better socialize responsible future citizens or re-socialize youth who were branded as supposedly losing their way. Institutions won increased support, public support, in the early 20th century with the growth of the field of social science. The professional training offered by social work, medical, and educational professionals provided a scientific justification for more specialized services and also for 24-7 institutional care for children. 
The rise in supposed humanitarianism of social welfare was, however, for whites only. Orphanages and industrial schools were not available to blacks when families were in need. For black children, this often meant growing up in hospitals, prisons, poor houses, and alongside adults in most of those institutions. Sorry, we're just having trouble going to the next slide here, even though I pressed that. What software is it linked to? Uh, it's embedded from a PowerPoint right into the Adobe Connect. Johnston, uh, who envisioned this, was tragically murdered before his vision for an institute by and for children was built. It was um, an internal conflict in the family. A month after his death, legislators in Nova Scotia actually passed... Can we also see them at the same time? That's what I We could do that, that would be great. Yeah, I'm not sure. I don't use Adobe. Okay, much, so. Yeah. If not, let's just go back to the original screen. I do need. So, how do I get back to seeing them after I've gone through a slide? That's a good question. <laughs> I'm not sure if this is Adobe. Okay, so let's just stop sharing maybe and it will go back to. Or do we just put there? Perfect. That's perfect. That's perfect. But I don't know, so try. See, now that we're not in full screen. Okay, well, let's go to full screen and then I'll go back and forth and I'll do that. I can do that. I can go back and forth to full screen. I can do this. I can okay, do so I'm just perfect. using the arrow buttons. Okay, thank you so much. That's okay. perfect. Okay. All right, we'll work on that and I'll flip back and forth. And again, apologies. So um, after Johnson was tragically murdered, a month after his death, Legislators in Nova Scotia passed an act to incorporate the Nova Scotia Home for Colored Children and empower it, quote, for the care, education, and training of the members of the Afro-American race, end quote, and to act as a children's aid society, quote, for matters affecting the children of the colored race and to receive and keep the same under their care pursuant to the provisions of the Children's Protection Act of 1912, end quote. Then soon followed the Halifax explosion, which some of you probably know much about, uh, December 6, 1917, which leveled the very soon to be opening institute that had been uh, planned for. So the explosion created actually a greater need for this kind of institute for the black community whose homes in the North End were the ones that were primarily leveled and destroyed. But at the same time, due to the rebuilding needs of the, of the city, it also dropped the priority of black education uh, from the purview of the state. It would really be up to the African United Baptist Association and black leaders, such as James Alexander Ross Kinney, to raise funds from both black and white members of the community for the institute. The home, when it did open in 1921, would focus more on housing children rather than on education. And it would be open until the 1990s in various iterations. Now the mandate and the structure of the home changed with two world wars, the civil rights movement, the closure of large orphanages, as well as desegregation of schools. Unfortunately, with the time we have, those changes are really beyond the scope of this presentation. But historian Veronica Strongbow makes clear in her own work um, on institutional care of children, which she's written two different volumes, that the general story of the history of institutional care is one of tragedy marked by neglect, abuse, and stigmatization. This is the story of the Nova Scotia Home for Colored Children, but it is a complex one, an unknown one, of institutionalized racism for social welfare. It is a story in which a white government purchased land and handed over authority for the care to mostly black workers, but the home was chronically underfunded and under-resourced, and the state turned its back when a cycle of violence and poverty created by systemic racism in Nova Scotia ended up manifesting itself in the home. So the DOOR project seeks to tell the story of those uh, who are the former residents and to share those stories with students, which I'll talk about more in a bit. But first, I think it's really important that you hear more about those experiences, which Tony has joined us today uh, to talk a little bit about. So Tony, I'm going to take it over to you while I try to get the screen back there.
Over to you, Tony. We can just hear you a little louder. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> right. Hello, everybody. Uh, my, my name is Tony Smith, and I just want to share you with uh, some of my experience on this here to where we are today. Um, I'm a former resident of No Social and Public Realm, as I said previously. I uh, went in 1965, and I was there, and I left at uh, 1968. So I was five years old when I went in. I was eight years old, eight and a half when I left. Um, my experience there wasn't very positive. Uh, there was uh, physical, sexual, and emotional abuse um, and neglect. Uh, we were always hungry and um, made to fight each other and things of that nature. And the reason why I'm saying that is that what I've learned um, since I went public in, in, in 1998 uh, by accident, I was advocating uh, trying to educate child protection workers of uh, the experience as a foster care carrier and as well as a public home. And, um, a reporter had contacted me. Uh, basically, the, the old home was looking to get heritage status and get funding for the old building. And in doing so, they thought it would be nice to have a former resident's perspective. I told them, uh, I, I don't mind telling my story, but it may not be the story you want to hear. Not so much for myself personally. I, I, I moved on for a lot of things I experienced in the home. But uh, for my friend Anthony Langford, uh, who had a heart condition, and I took a severe beating um, when I was seven years of age, and um, a few days after that, uh, he had passed away, and in the nature of the public, the staff wanted to cover that up. And the abuse that I was subject to made me feel that um, they can do whatever they want to you, they need to take your life. His life was nothing, therefore my life was nothing. But somehow I always uh, thought that I was going to tell his story. I didn't know exactly how, and um, when the opportunity came, I was approached by the media from my perspective of living in a home. That's the story I wanted to tell. And in doing so, um, uh, a number of other people came forward and started to uh, launch uh, individual lawsuits against the uh, colored home as well as government. It started, uh, went up to about 164, and then uh, we got certified and, and got approved for a, a class action a lawsuit. And in doing so, uh, we were able to settle with the colored home as well as the uh, provincial government uh, uh, out of court, as well as receive an apology uh, from the colored home as well as the uh, provincial government. But the Premier, uh, Steve McNeil, not only apologized to us former residents for being abused, but also apologized for the African Nova Scotia community uh, because of systemic discrimination that has plagued our uh, history. And so with this uh, inquiry, what we're trying to do is to look at the abuse and, and why it happened. And, and Christina gave a very excellent uh, summary of, of the history as to why the home came to light and was segregation was because of racism. And um, uh, looking at the other broader issues of systemic discrimination. So we're looking to try to build relationships that were never really there to, to more or less be at the table, have dialogue, and try to make changes around the educational system, the justice system, child welfare, and things of that nature. Um, it, it's been an event that uh, it is very historic because, uh, as Christina said earlier, the colored home is deprived of uh, the, the black community. Um, it has received a lot of uh, attention of uh, this institution was second to none in North America at the time. But it was very difficult to come up and speak against uh, this institution because you're also speaking almost as if you're speaking against uh, the success of, of the black community. It, it, it was a failure in that sense. And, and it wasn't. Um, it, it was for some of us that were abused. There were some of the kids that were not abused. There were staff that uh, tried to do the right thing. And uh, of course, speaking out against, uh, they did not get their jobs and they were threatened to lose their jobs. And of course, there wasn't too many jobs for black uh, uh, people, especially in that area. And very difficult today. So we're trying to address some of the old uh, past policies that had failed us, and looking at uh, what policies are in place today that are still failing us, and what we can do to improve upon it. So this journey has been very positive. Uh, it's been well received. Um, we have a lot of great people like yourself and people in the audience that, that want to help us share this here story. I think this is a great opportunity for us in Nova Scotia. To learn more about our black history. Um, so this project is, is, is uh, I can tell you right now, on behalf of Jerry and Tracy, who are uh, the co-members of Voices, that we're very proud and very happy to know that this is one of this legacy and what we're doing our journey is always going to be recorded with great people like you supporting us. So um, I'm 
I'm very happy and very honored to be a part of what's going on here today. Um, Jerry, we, we um, have been told that we can um, also, I think, thankfully, run into lunch a little bit if we had the time. Jerry, do you mind sharing maybe a quick um, uh, um, experience at the home, if you feel comfortable, Jerry, doing that? Uh, we'll just have to get you to speak right into the mic, Jerry. Lake Tony, I'm a former uh, resident of the Hope College Children, and, and I went through different stages of, of abuse, and my abuse would basically involve the fact that I wasn't black enough. Because in Nova Scotia, the black, your blackness determines how you get treated to a certain extent. I looked like I wasn't black, I looked like I was Chinese, and I got abused based on that fact. I got name called and everything else. So mine was more of a uh, system of loneliness and uh, basically unacceptance. One of the key things about the home, if you had no family, which, when I went into the home, I, I was registered as having no family. And when they found out you had no family, you became more of the abuses because you had nobody to go back to. You had nobody to, to uh, say, I was abused or, or whatever. So that left you home alone by yourself all the time and uh, even the, poor, even the uh, other residents that were bullying you knew that and they would bully you all the more because they knew you had no way to go back to and because you were different, because you were uh, different from the rest, you weren't accepted as the rest. So that was a major challenge I, I had to deal with that not only in the home but when I came out of the home because the legacy of the home hung around my neck like a noose and what was happening is when you came out of the home, people didn't accept God because you were a resident of the home, which was a blight in some cases to other members of the community, black members of the community. I just wanted to make note, mention that the vision that you guys have up there right now. Um, I actually went to the home in 61 for a brief short period of time, and the lady and they're old, that, that, that little child, that's me. Oh, and if you look at the tire there, the guy behind the tire, that's me. And what Jerry is saying is very true. I'm very fair complected. And I was discriminated against by my own people because of my fair complexion, as well as people who are dark complected were considered to be, and uh, they called their names as well. You had to be the gold brown to be considered to be black. And I know it's strange to hear this, but unfortunately, that's one of the other things that we had to suffer. We, we didn't feel we fit in anywhere in the white society or black society. Thank you for sharing. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Jen now to share a little bit about uh, the inquiry. Great. So uh, as, as uh, Tony has indicated, uh, through the advocacy of former residents, and, and in particular, the kind of model of how uh, voices came together to um, include and connect uh, and work collaboratively with former residents, they had a retreat, uh, for example, in 2012. Uh, where they gathered together across the generations who've been in the home. Um, and uh, and what was striking to them was that while they may not have all known one another in the home, they had very similar experiences of, of abuse, of harm, of isolation, and of shame following their time in the home. And when they gathered together and were able to talk about that, um, they became connected to one another and, and committed to supporting one another in healing. Um, and they've been guided by these, um, this idea that they're on a journey to life together and this real commitment uh, to the principles of doing no further harm and leaving no one behind. And those principles were hugely significant when they started to think about what the legal system um, could, uh, could help them get in terms of uh, justice. Uh, so together with their counsel, they were very clear that while it was important for the harms to be acknowledged and for them to be able to uh, settled the class action claim, it was also equally important that, that what came wasn't just compensation, but was actually a catalyst for um, making what happened to them matter, and uh, making it make a difference. Um, and so there was an immense amount of leadership in terms of the vision of what justice actually looked like for the former residents. Um, and they were clear, for example, that alongside um, a settlement or compensation to the court system, they wanted there to be some kind of process where the other um, people who have responsibility for this, the home, the African Nova Scotian community, um, and, uh, and the government, and the various departments of government, 
would come together and work collaboratively with them to ensure that there would be no further harm, ensure that their uh, voices would be heard and make a difference, um, and think about leaving no one behind. And so they started to think about a public inquiry model. They were pretty clear from all that we, we've had our share of public inquiries in Canada and certainly in Nova Scotia, they were pretty clear that they didn't just want uh, someone to hear all their stories and then decide what should happen, and they didn't want a report that would just sit on the shelf, but that they wanted this to be an opportunity to bring partners together to do things in a different way, and actually to be able to hear one another, build relationships that would um, stand the test of time and be a firm foundation for addressing systemic racism in the province. And so, um, in some ways, it started very clearly with the, the historic apology from the Premier for, um, for systemic racism and a commitment that this piece of work around the restorative inquiry would be a first step in making good, not only in saying the story, but in understanding what it is that we need you to do to change. So you'll see in this image, um, the terms of reference and further information about the restorative inquiry are available online at restorativeinquiry.ca. You can also there see the video of the Premier's apology and, uh, and the reports because the restorative inquiry is underway. But you'll see that the inquiry has articulated its uh, stages of the process um, in, in terms of the way in which it works to reflect these goals. We've had a focus on building relationships throughout, but certainly intensively at the beginning, so that people are really working collaboratively as partners. We've had a commitment to learning and understanding. So that's the phase we're in currently, where we're not making findings and telling people uh, in the Department of Community Services, and Welfare and Justice, what they did wrong. We're inviting them into the process and asking for their support and their input uh, to be inquiring within their own systems, to be inquiring alongside other systems of government and with the community. What do we know and understand about what happened? What do we need to know about how to make it matter and make a difference in the future? And how do we build upon that understanding for the final phase of work, uh, which is planning and action? And that may mark the restorative inquiry apart from other inquiry models most significantly in the sense that um, it committed to change in real time, committed to utilizing the space and opportunity that we have to facilitate collaborative work, to look at what can we change now, what difference can we make for children, families, and communities, uh, particularly those within the African Nova Scotia community, but more broadly in Nova Scotia and on issues of systemic racism, and how can we uh, make plans together for what commitments and further action will follow. Um, so if you just flip to the uh, next slide, work then in a, in a number of different ways. So the process is quite flexible as well. It doesn't look like a typical hearing room. Um, so we, uh, we facilitate processes where it's not all of the information flowing to those on the council parties or the commissioners, but rather the council parties and commissioners uh, hosting opportunities for groups to learn from one another and explore what the significance of this example uh, means for them, particularly in terms of thinking about the child welfare system um, and how it's uh, functioning now and ways that we're keeping those patterns and how we might disrupt those. Um, we, uh, we work in a facilitative way. Um, some of those processes are public, uh, some of them are private, but always in the public interest. So we're always sharing that work and that knowledge out so it can make a difference. And we work at levels. Uh, we're working within particular parties, we're bringing parties and partners together across government or across government and community that need to understand and work together, and also bringing larger multi-stakeholder processes together on certain issues. Um, and there's a significant focus for us on the child welfare system for examining um, uh, both uh, in institutional care and care and community, uh, how do we think about care systems and how those who are requiring um, care within the uh, child protection and child welfare system are experiencing that system, both uh, coming into care, during care, um, and as they need care. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, 
so um, I want to tell you then a little bit about um, how Door comes into this with the inquiry. Oh, sorry, I'll put my mic here. I was trying not to do too many mics at one time. Um, so the Door project really is working in partnership with the inquiry, as well as another a number of other um, organizations like the African Canadian Services Division of the Ministry of Education in Nova Scotia and other uh, university partners as well. Voices, of course, is a partner. Um, and the mandate with respect to the inquiry is really to focus on education. You will have noticed in a previous slide the Sankofa bird. The Sankofa is also is part of the symbol uh, of the actual door project itself. Um, and you'll notice that the bird is looking backwards in, before it flies forward. And that's really what the project is about, seeking the best knowledge of the past in order to understand how to fly forward. Um, so the purpose of DOOR um, is to create virtual reality oral histories for schools with Tony, as well as with Jerry, who you've met, um, and Tracy Dorrington Skinner, who is an educator and who couldn't be with us. Um, so you can see those pictures there. We're using virtual reality. Um, uh, I'm at a tech university, and I thought, how can we use technology for a good purpose? So um, that, uh, I think that is part of the reason. Um, but it really does have immersive visuals and interactive capabilities. And this is at the heart of what a restorative process is about, which is building relationality. How can we build relationality between students and survivors who cannot meet in person? Who we aren't asking survivors to tell their stories over and over again in various locations. How can we leave that as a, a, a longer legacy as a historian? I wonder how can this uh, be preserved? So the point of using virtual reality is to engage students with the personal storytelling of former residents as they're able to actually walk together through the changing historical landscape of the Nova Scotia Home for Colored Children and of race relations in the province. The digital stories, the virtual reality experience will not stand on its own. We are, uh, have a whole team of history educators who will be working with the former residents to create a curricular unit for grade 11 African uh, Canadian <coughs> studies in Nova Scotia, a very unique um, course in Nova Scotia, as well as the grade 11 Canadian history courses. So this multidisciplinary community-based team, I mean, we have everyone from people who are gamers, who I uh, don't think maybe so much about the legacy of social welfare sometimes. Um, and then we have you know, educators and historians, we really, and, and legal scholars, I mean, we really have a multidisciplinary team working with community uh, to seek to really assess if and how this kind of storytelling can develop a number of elements for students. Their historical consciousness, their historical thinking skills, particularly ethical dimensions of what we understand about the past. Can it foster relational learning, again, at the heart of restorative justice in schools, in, in which that kind of re uh, relational understanding is based on having sustained encounters with each other, uh, with each other's past, as well as with directly oppressive formations that have happened in the past? And can we do this um, kind of work and support culturally relevant learning that r raises students' consciousness about social power relations and how they connect past to present? <coughs> So we're currently in the development year of the project, uh, and we plan to launch in classrooms in the spring of uh, 2019, uh, assuming that all goes well, which we, um, it is, it is so far, so that's great. So I can't really attest yet to the project outcomes, which I wish I could for you, but I can provide you with a real glimpse of the potential effects of the school project. So my nephew, Owen, when he was 11 years old, decided to do a heritage fair project. I'm sure many of you have probably heard of these heritage fair projects. Um, and given that this is my sister's son, uh, he decided not to do a project on Justin Bieber, which a lot of other people were for um, the heritage fair. Instead, he decided to interview Tony and to learn something about the Nova Scotia Home for Colored Children. And it's really that encounter that inspired this whole project. <laughs> It's, it's that encounter between Owen and Tony that made us think, wow, we need to do this on a larger scale. Oh, there so I think, that's, I think that's actually Elliot. So Elliot is my other nephew, um, who was off school sick today, so we can all say hi, Elliot. Hi, Elliot. Hi, Elliot. Yeah. Um, so um, <laughs> their, their really reflections on um, this in interview really demonstrate the potential affective and relational dimensions of oral history for both the listener and the storyteller. So Tony, and forgive me if I'm putting words in your mouth so you can correct me, Tony, but Tony describes being moved when sharing his childhood stories of trauma with Owen 
because he saw hope in building new forms of remembrances with the next generation. His life story will assist to deconstruct Eurocentric narratives of the past that serve to exclude African Nova Scotians from a sense of belonging and to construct new historical narratives that really privilege the activism of African Nova Scotians. And Owen became keenly aware through the personal storytelling of Tony of his comparative freedoms as a white middle class boy. He further understood that the current community challenges he sees around him, higher rates of violence and poverty, the lower rates of graduation among African Nova Scotian children, are part of a historical legacy of racist discrimination. So from Tony's life story, Owen really has built a, a feeling of shared responsibility to redress this injustice and build right relations going forward. And that is what we want for other students and other children. So uh, if we are to accept uh, the correlation that researchers have found between youth interest in community affairs and their uh, increased political engagement in justice issues, then I think we're really hopeful that DOOR can be a form of reconciliation education through oral history and will positively affect students' commitment to civic justice. I think when we enable students to see that, quote, violence might best be understood as the disruption and far too often the outright destruction of a people's story, end quote, then the harmful legacy of social welfare work may also be disrupted. So, uh, we are going to, we have some time. We actually finished on time despite technical issues. Um, that's a hooray. Um, and so I'm going to open it up for you to ask any questions that you might have uh, for Jennifer, Jerry, um, Tony, Elliot maybe. Elliot's heard a lot about the project. Elliot is not talking about it. Or myself. So I'll just open it up to the room. And the project as we see here rooted reconciliation commission reports and but I, my sort of uh, um, I think it is very relevant and timely uh, the truth and reconciliation commission lots of talk is there and some uh, implementations is coming so I uh, that is very timely, but uh, is there some uh, people from racialized community are part of the envisioning of the project, planning and implementation of this project, and if you can share some of your views. Um, so, um, Tony and Jerry and Trish, Tracy are the three narrators, and also all the, uh, a host of people involved with the uh, inquiry are all uh, African Nova Scotians. Um, and as well, and con conceived of the project with us um, in collaboration, as well as other members. If you'll go on the website, we have the DOOR website, DOOR.ca, you'll see all the members of the team, um, including those from the African Canadian Services Division uh, of the um, uh, Ministry of Education in Nova Scotia, who are also um, from the community, from the African Nova Scotia community. Jen, did you want, or Tony or Jerry, want to speak more to that? We had trouble hearing that question. Oh, just wondering about um, those from racialized communities who are part of conceiving the project and uh, are part of the collaboration. Right. So, I mean, I think your answer is uh, right. We, what, what may not be evident is the council of parties is um, made up almost entirely outside of the few observers of um, of, African, of those uh, with close connections or, and from the African Nova Scotian community. And the uh, Restorative Inquiry Council of Parties is deeply connected to this project because we see it as, a, um, as a, a, an important mechanism of sharing knowledge, continuing to build relationships, and continuing to work in the way in which we've uh, been trying to work. Um, so instead of having just a flat report, uh, there will also be uh, this opportunity to um, share learning and, and have a good community. So there's a, a high amount of interest in uh, those who are, who are African Nova Scotia. Yes, uh, Nova Scotia has uh, 48 uh, black communities throughout the province, and uh, normally um, the rural areas feel disconnected because of uh, the distance. This is an opportunity for us to get. Uh, feedback and input 
from the various communities, uh, the black communities, so that we can come together collectively as one voice to address some of the issues that have been, uh, that we've been dealing with for 400 years since we, we arrived in Nova Scotia. Um, that has never happened before. Um, normally, uh, people in the local area tend to be so-called leaders and, and, and their voices are not being heard. So this is an opportunity for us to, to do this here provincially, to go around and, and collectively look at the present issues and what is priority that we have to address in the various uh, departments and agencies that we identified as partners. Thanks very much. Well, that, and you're not very much connected to the door project for us because it will work classrooms and be part of engaging with um, uh, youth also in the community. Uh, in terms of the, the testing and the opportunity to integrate this into the curriculum. And, and when looking at the issues around systemic discriminations, it shows up differently in the different uh, communities we depend on where you come from. And uh, again, a, a lot of the rural areas got to help us because when we try to address these situations around racism, <laughs> if they were to speak out, they don't have support. Um, normally they're branded as well as their families as far as getting employment, things that make so we're, we're looking to address those issues. Uh, we have another question. Yeah, um, thank you for sharing this information. It was really informative, um, and I think you guys are doing great, great work. Um, I just wanted to get more information about, you talked that there was a grade 11 African-Canadian studies that was going to be started. You mentioned that it was a pilot project, right? Sorry, no, that course already exists. Oh, it already uh, exists. It's just this will be piloted within that course in the Canadian history uh, grade 11 level. So that's the classrooms in which we'll share, um, we'll share this work. Okay, and did you guys have any like resistance from the government in wanting to bring to light the racial issue, racial Canadian issues that are happening um, in the black community, or was it pretty well received? Yeah, I'll I'll let you uh, you address that. So, any of you in Nova Scotia? <laughs> so they asked, uh, sorry, she asked if we had any evidence from the government to bring these issues to light in Nova Scotia. Yes, if there's been any resistance to this work from the government in Nova Scotia. Yeah. So, um, you want to well, take a, take a go Okay. Um, yes, when we uh, first came out and we formed voices in 2012 advocating on behalf of former residents, we had a lot of resistance uh, from the previous government at the time, uh, the NDP party, uh, that was opposed to uh, settling and was opposed to a public inquiry. Uh, the leader of the opposition party said that if the election was coming up, if they were to get in power, they both said that they would grant us uh, an inquiry. Um, the Liberal Party got into power, and uh, the, the night that uh, the campaign, the first uh, priority he had stated was to, to have the public party for the public home. And knowing that we're no longer adversaries and we're no longer fighting, we want to make sure that our stories are, are going to be useful to help uh, that this doesn't happen any for the kids. As Jennifer was saying earlier, it's different than your traditional public inquiry. Um, the, the Premier has said to us that I, I want you, the former residents, to, uh, to, to select the design team. I want you, the former residents, to come up with terms of reference. I want you, the former residents, to come up with a model that you feel will do no further harm. Uh, I don't want it to be perceived as government interference. So um, we have complete autonomy, and that's why we have a government representative on the Council of Partners as well as various uh, uh, as former residents and people from the Black community and, and other organizations so that we come together collectively with our experiences to look at how we address this here so there'll be no bias. Uh, no one person runs the show, no one person has the authority to stop anything. Uh, whatever information you come out that may be embarrassing to government, they said they take full responsibility because it's time for us to make a change. So we're, we're, we're coming in at a different angle. Uh, normally when we approach some of the, the other agencies like the RCMP or the, the police or the ACMP or the public home, um, they hang up and they think that you're, they're, we're coming in to tell them what they have to do and we're not doing that. We're actually trying to share information together and collectively look at ways in the past so we can actually move forward and because what's been going on in the past has not been successful so we have to do a different model. And I have to say I'm very proud of that because we've been recognized nationally and internationally and recently by the United Nations that this model that we're doing with the RRI in Nova Scotia is not only good for Nova Scotia but all across Canada. Um, so I just one sentence which is that you know, it is remarkable from the perspective of thinking about what is required for institutional change um, to be testing out this process as an opportunity for the institutions to engage as responsible partners within the process in real time for how the process unfolds and also uh, what kinds of things they can accomplish together. So part of the structure of the, the sort of inquiry is actually a reflection and action team that includes amongst it 
uh, deputy ministers from all of the major human service departments, justice, education, uh, community services, health, uh, and cultural affairs, and uh, heritage and cultural affairs. So, so that group um, is working in tandem all, uh, all the way through to ensure the success of the inquiry and reporting to the legislature at regular intervals about how they're able to engage. And we just had the first of those reports and what was kind of truly remarkable about it, it was on Friday, is that the uh, Premier stood up and, and uh, reiterated his commitment to acknowledge and to uh, be uh, responding to systemic racism and that this uh, court the inquiry is part of that, as did the leader of the opposition and the leader of the third party, um, all stood up in a, in a, in a, a bipartisan way. Uh, to support this work. So I think there's been quite a significant change in terms of uh, government seeing itself as potentially part of the solution rather than only the problem. Any other questions? I'm mindful that we're now keeping them from lunch. So, uh, so perhaps we'll just say thank you so much for letting us share the work of the inquiry and the voices in the door with you today. Thanks.